Hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Giesen. I'm the editorial director for business and economics at the Greuther. And um, together with Martin Reeves, I expect him he will join the meeting uh, immediately. Uh, I'm hosting today today's webinar about how to master the science of organizational change. And the structure of the webinar is as follows. Um, I will say some uh, introductory words about the Greuther. And then I will introduce Martin. He will give a keynote session around 40 minutes. And in the end, there will be a kind of Q&A session. And um, so you have the opportunity um, to ask us questions. Uh, for this, please use the chat room, see below, and uh, yeah, ask us questions. And uh, yeah. As I said in the beginning, that I work for the Greuther. Let me say some words about the Greuther. The Greuther is based in Berlin and is one of the oldest independent publishers in Germany. With a history dating back since more than 270 years. We are a leading publisher of academic content and also publish books uh, for business professionals. In total, we publish around 1,300 new books each year, next to journals and digital products. Yeah, now it's my pleasure to introduce Martin. I'm still waiting for him, um, but maybe I can say some words about him in the beginning. Um, Martin um, is a managing director and senior partner at uh, the BCG San Francisco office and um, chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute, uh, the BCG's vehicle for exploring ideas from beyond the world and business, which have implications for the business, tree, uh, business strategy management. Martin joined um, BCG in London in 1989 and later moved to Tokyo, where he was responsible for BCG's business with Western clients. Uh, his consulting career has focused on strategy with equal emphasis on idea origination and development and application by consulting with clients on their strategy search challenges. And that's one of the reasons why Martin is here. Um, Martin is co-author um, of the Greuther and BCG Henderson's Institute. And so we have a series called Inspiring the Next Game. This is a series of books on emerging themes in business. The series includes insights from the intersection of business, science, technology, economics, and society, and draws on the work of dozens of BC Henderson Institute's fellows, ambassadors, and collaborators over several years. The first book is um, Mastering the Science of Change. Um, the organizational change to be exact. The subject to, uh, of this webinar today, today's discussion, and there are also four coming books like Winning the Twenties, Leadership Agenda for the Next Decade, The Resilient Enterprise, or Winning the Digital World, among others. Yeah, and now it's my pleasure to hopefully get uh, Martin here on, on the screen. Um, so I'm Martin Reeves. I'm the chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute, which is BCG's uh, strategy um, uh, think tank. And we're pleased to announce a uh, partnership with uh, the publisher De Greuter, represented by Stefan today, um, where we intend to publish a series of books um, for managers, leaders, and students of business on emerging uh, topics in, in business uh, from our latest research. <clears throat> so we have um, four in gestation. Uh, you see three here that are uh, basically complete and uh, one which is already published. Um, so the first one is gonna be on, uh, no, back please, mm -hmm. slide back. 
Uh, the first one is on mastering the science of organizational change. That's the one we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, the second one is going to be about shift in the basis of competition um, uh, in the next decade. How will companies compete? Uh, the third one is on a theme which is uh, coming out of the COVID crisis, uh, which is uh, resilience. Um, all CEOs are now talking about uh, resilience, uh, the, the ability to adjust to uh, stressed uh, conditions and to thrive under new circumstances. Um, that will be the third one, and we have another one coming out on, on, on digital strategy. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Yes, I do. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the book which is, which is already available um, on Amazon or from uh, De Gruyter's website in uh, electronic form and, uh, and book form. And um, so what we're talking about here is the, what we call the science of organizational change. And um, it includes topics like uh, preemptive change, changing before you need to, um, uh, looking at the value of early action, for example, uh, looking at how you can create a sense of urgency before things are broken, um, looking at um, into the future with not past-oriented performance metrics, but future-oriented metrics, um, and so on. And then we have a section on change strategies, um, which is basically about using a more scientific evidence-based approach to, to change, um, and different types of change too. Um, so for instance, how to turn around a successful company, how to turn around a distressed company, um, how to navigate M&A turnarounds where you acquire uh, a distressed company. And then um, we talk about some ideas on how to uh, progress the change paradigm, how to fundamentally rethink change. So we talk about, for instance, continuous transformation. Um, we talk about uh, strategy stretching games. Um, in other words, how do we change our mental models of the business? And we talk about navigating digital change. So let's, um, let's click on some of those now. And I'll try and speak for about 30 minutes, so we've got plenty of time um, for, for, for Q&A. So the next, uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Um, so why did we write a book on change? Um, well, as I, I say to people, there's only two things wrong with change management. One of them is how we think about change, and, and the other one is, is how we manage it. Um, there, there are very few topics that are more important in business than change management. The velocity of the competitive environment um, is, is faster than ever. Um, so in other words, if you look at the excess returns to uh, leading companies, it used to be that uh, leading performance lasted at least 10 years. Now uh, it's very much less than that. It's sort of the order of a year. So what does that mean? That means that large companies need to reinvent themselves uh, constantly, and that needs, means that they need to be changing all of the time. Um, and so you can see here that um, if we define a total shareholder return deterioration of 10 percentage points, which is quite a lot, um, a typical a uh, good performing company produces uh, up to 20% um, uh, total shareholder return. So you're talking about a 50% uh, degradation in performance for a, for a, for a leading company. About 33% of companies, about a third of companies at any time basically need change. Not all of them launch a change program, but about a third uh, need to. Um, but um, uh, uh, only one in four of them succeeds. And this is a very modest criterion of success. So what we assume is that any company um, which is uh, attempting a change program wants to at least be average, at least achieve sector median returns and from a position of disadvantage. And we see that that's only the case in 25% of cases. And if we set a more ambitious goal, the number would be even smaller. So we really do need a better approach to, to change management. And that's what the book is, uh, is about. Um, so the next uh, slide, please. Um, so today I'm, I can't, um, we don't have time to cover all of the topics in the book, but I want to talk about three, pit, pit, three pitfalls and three approaches to those common pitfalls. So one of them is um, treating change as monolithic. Um, the word change suggests that there's a thing called change, a single thing called change. Um, in fact, I'll show you that there are many types of change, and we need the right approach for the right type of change. <clears throat> the second one is relying on intuition. Um, change is not typically something that companies do all of the time, at least major change, and therefore we tend to rely on 
apparently reasonable, reasonable intuitions. And it turns out that those intuitions are just not good enough. We need a more scientific evidence-based approach to change, and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> and then the third one is, um, is basically the say, uh, is about the saying, uh, if, if, uh, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Um, and the idea that you change when you need to change. Um, uh, but of course, if you wait until your company is distressed, uh, then it makes change a lot harder. And I'll talk about the evidence for that and what one can do about that. So let's go through these um, three uh, problems, common, very common problems, uh, leading to that 75% failure rate of major change and uh, share some thoughts. And by the way, these thoughts are the result of research by what we call the BCG Fellows. So BCG Fellows are um, senior partners, experienced partners, who, um, <clears throat> uh, who, who basically get three years um, to, to research a, a future-oriented uh, uh, topic. And, um, and also from our external collaborators, for instance, uh, Professor Simon Levin, at Princeton University, who is a mathematical uh, biologist who uh, basically has, uh, has, has helped us a lot uh, figuring out what is change, how does it happen, what types of change are there, how do you measure it, how do you manage it, and so on. So let's go on to the, uh, the next slide. So the, um, this is the first myth, if you like, which is that there's a single thing called change. Um, there isn't a single thing called change. Uh, there are many types of change and we need the right approach for the right circumstances. So you can think about change as climbing a hill. Um, you know, the, the, the valley or the swamp is where we are. And we want to be on the top of the hill. We want to find a better state. And the typical way of thinking about change is what I call a planned itinerary, which is you know where you're starting, you know where you're ending, um, you know the steps along the way, you plan them, the, you execute a plan. So this is the sort of change management that is very common in large companies. Uh, typically you have a project management office, you have a project plan, you have a Gantt chart, you have milestones, uh, you look at achievement against milestones, it's a planned journey. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this under the right circumstances, and there are some right circumstances. So if, for example, you want to reduce cost by 5% or 10%, um, uh, normally you don't have to change the fabric of the company to do so. Uh, you've generally done these things before. It's generally a predictable and a planable process, and you'd be advised to adopt a planned itinerary approach. Uh, many companies are, are very good at this, and I give the example of uh, uh, the major stationary retailer uh, or office uh, supplies retailer Staples, uh, which uh, executed uh, very effectively a cost reduction program with a planned itinerary approach uh, several years ago. But that's not the only type of change. Um, if you think about um, uh, another type of change, which I call the river crossing, this is, you know where you're going, the, the other side of the river, but you don't know where the stepping stones are. You don't know exactly how to get there. Um, and so this might be typical of the change program, the much publicized change program, the Starbucks, uh, the uh, the coffee um, the coffee shop retailer um, uh, undertook a few years ago, uh, where it wanted to increase customer loyalty and customization, and it but it didn't really know how that was going to happen. Um, so they tried a bunch of stuff and they changed directions and they experimented and they ended up with a uh, a highly effective, customized um, uh, social media mediated uh, marketing campaign. Uh, that uh, increased loyalty, increased, increased purchases, and was very successful. Um, but there wasn't a, a plan at the beginning of the process that, that didn't change along the way. So you might call this an adaptive approach to change. There's another type of change, which is quite similar, but fundamentally different, uh, which, which I call hill climbing, where if you imagine you're climbing through a forest, your legs tell you whether you're going in the right direction. You can certainly tell whether you're climbing the steep hill or not. But you can't see the peak. You don't know exactly where you're going. Um, so John Deere, the uh, agricultural equipment manufacturer, manufacturer is, a, is a pioneer in digital ecosystems um, in, uh, in agriculture, uh, trying to create new types of uh, services and business models with uh, digital platforms in agriculture. And it actually doesn't know what the end state looks like, because that end state doesn't exist in the world. Um, uh, nobody in agriculture is making the majority of their profit from digital platforms currently. 
Um, however, uh, they know it when they see it. They know when their metrics go in the right direction. So this is a different type of uh, ad adaptive approach. Um, there is the not uncommon problem of what you might call escape from the swamp, which is you don't necessarily know where you're going, but you know that you want to escape from your current situation. You're in a state of distress, and urgent and pragmatic action is required. Uh, as the retailer Best Buy, for example, a few years ago, implemented a, a sort of an emergency turnaround program to take rapid pragmatic action to uh, to exit its current state, and then later thought about its long-term destination. And then uh, there's another type of change, which actually is almost the opposite of a, of a planned itinerary, uh, which you might call scouting and wandering, which is you're on a landscape for the first time, you don't know where the peaks and the valleys and the swamps and the rivers are, so you need to survey, you need to probe and wander and scout. Um, so actually, uh, you have a deliberately uh, random strategy, a bit like test drilling in oil, where you wander here and there and you survey the landscape in order to know the landscape well enough to, to develop a plan. Um, so my bigger point here is that we need to de-average change. We need to talk about different types of change management for different, uh, different circumstances. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and once you do that, um, I think we come on to the second myth, um, which is that our intuition is good enough. Um, our intuition is not good enough to drive successful change, as I've showed you by the failure statistics. And um, much is talked about with, in terms of the digital transformation of businesses, uh, but one of the last places for the data revolution to reach is, is change management. Uh, now, one of the things that's changed in strategy since I, I began uh, to practice uh, strategy as a consultant 30 years ago is that we can now almost analyze almost anything uh, using a big data set, sometimes an unstructured data set, and uh, using uh, artificial intelligence and other techniques. So we can actually ask the question empirically uh, what works for different types of change process. We can bring the data revolution to, uh, to change management. Um, so here I'm looking at um, what I call reactive change, which is a company has gotten into trouble, their performance is declining, and they've undertaken a, trans a transformation program. And we've looked at uh, many hundreds of transformations, <clears throat> um, and we've said basically what works, and we've, we've assembled a, a, a colossal data set and, and looked at what actually works in practice. And you can see that um, some things about strategic orientation um, are very important. For instance, um, uh, even if you have a cost problem or a growth problem, um, maintaining a sufficient level of R&D expenditure turns out to be a key success factor. We can measure companies' strategic orientation, how they're thinking, using text analytics, semantic, uh, semantic analysis. Uh, we, can, we can work out which companies are long-term oriented and short-term oriented. So a crisis may feel like a short-term event, but unless you approach it uh, with a long-term uh, orientation, uh, then uh, your, your, your change strategy is unlikely to be uh, sustainably successful. Um, uh, c capital expenditure in uh, new, growth, uh, new, new growth drivers uh, is another critical success factor. Um, leadership change helps. Um, we know that um, hiring from the outside increases the risk, but also increases the, uh, the, the average return, for example. And we know that formal programs, many companies have an informal change program. They try harder, they, uh, they adopt stricter goals. Um, they, they have a more, um, uh, they, they increase their managerial oversight, but actually a formalized change program um, uh, helps. And we can, we can also look at the numbers here, which is how much do they help? Um, how much do they, they impact uh, long run total shareholder return in, uh, in percentage points? Um, so we can say something about what works. Now, of course, individual circumstances will vary, but nevertheless, across hundreds of data points, uh, here are some of the factors which, uh, which, which, uh, which work. And um, some of these may seem obvious, but if you ask um, a manager, tell me what's important in change, they may give you 20 different factors, but these are the, uh, the, the seven which are empirically more important than others. Mm -hmm. um, so let's move to the next slide. Um, another um, uh, uh, intuition which turns out to be wrong is that um, declining performance um, is often seen as, a, as primarily a cost problem, especially in the short term. Um, and um, there are some good reasons for this. Um, 
uh, it, it's easier to control it's easier to control costs than revenues. Um, um, you get more predictability, and um, uh, you uh, there's an there's a, an arithmetic equation between you know cost reduction and, and profit increase. So people are often attracted to to cost reduction. In fact, to some to many companies, transformation is a, a sort of euphemism for cost reduction. Uh, but actually, um, in in the uh, even in the short run. Costs are not the most important factor. The most important factor is the expectation premium, the price earnings ratio of the company. Um, in other words, your credibility with investors, showing investors that you, uh, that you have a plan. Um, the costs are the second most important uh, component in the long run, and this again is for reactive transformation. Uh, but actually, revenues are very important, and in the long run, differential growth <coughs> is actually the thing which differentiates successful from unsuccessful transformations. Um, so we can also, using evidence, say uh, where does, the, uh, where does the, uh, the, the benefit of a successful transformation come from. And this accounts, I think, for the failure of many transformations, which is <clears throat> there's a short-term benefit from cost reduction, but the long-term benefit from differential growth is actually not obtained. Um, the time axis on this chart also gives a, a hint to another a mistaken intuition. So it's often the case that um, a management team will uh, wish to believe that um, a, a transformation program, a large scale change program, can be wrapped up in um, in six months um, or or one year. Uh, the truth is, um, again, from the evidence of hundreds of companies, is that successful transformations <clears throat> um, take much uh, longer. The the inconvenient truth is. Uh, it's more like five years of persistent effort to obtain uh, the growth benefits uh, rather, than, rather than one year. So and that is another failure factor, if you like, the lack of uh, persistence and having two short-term horizons, not just for the business, but for the transformation program itself. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, and we don't have time to go through all of the different change situations today. But if you look at different types of change situation, for instance, reactive change, preemptive change, and here we're looking at change involving uh, uh, M&A, it turns out that the success factors are, are different in different cases. So again, we need to differentiate the uh, tactics for the, uh, for the situation. <clears throat> so um, it turns out that over time, um, fairly, fairly consistently, about 50% of M&A deals involve a target which has uh, uh, below uh, sector average uh, performance. So there's, a, there's an opportunity to, uh, to turn around the, uh, the, the target. So we looked at the success rates and the success factors uh, for these sorts of transformations and attained a slightly different picture. Uh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> and um, here you can see an example of, uh, of that analysis, which is the success, the success factors for turnaround M&A. And again, you see a bunch of factors. And this was only a subset of the factors which managers said they thought were important based upon their intuitions. But these are the ones that turn out to be important. <clears throat> um, you can see that uh, uh, the, the relative magnitude is the long run impact <clears throat> on average across uh, hundreds of transformations um, uh, uh, in terms of percentage points of total shareholder return. <clears throat> and uh, you can see that R&D spend is important, long-termism is important, purposefulness is important. Uh, purposefulness is the, the stated uh, social mission or social contribution of a firm. Uh, nowadays, that's a very important component of performance without social license, um, <clears throat> without trust in the long term, uh, you'll undermine your performance. Um, Restructuring spend, speaking, speaking uh, treating restructuring spend as an investment, um, uh, trying to turn around a company without that investment uh, turns out to be not a good idea. Um, and uh, interestingly, the ambitiousness of the goals. In many cases, we could uh, ad obtain the publicly stated goals of transformations. And uh, while a high goal, um, in terms of a percentage growth target for sales or a percentage reduction target for cost, while a high goal doesn't guarantee success, uh, a low ball goal certainly guarantees only modest uh, re returns. <clears throat> but interestingly, overwhelmingly, the most important factor was the program start date. <clears throat> uh, so in other words, preemption. 
uh, turns out to be the most important thing. When did you turn around the, uh, the company? If, you're, if you start thinking about your turnaround plan uh, after you acquired the company and you start to, to turn the target around, the target M&A company, um, a year or more after you've acquired the company, then your odds of success and your rewards are considerably less. Next slide, please. Um, and in fact, I want to double click on that as the, as the, as the next theme. Um, so across all of the different types of change we looked at, um, uh, we looked at this, uh, the factor which showed up as the most important factor in the last chart I showed, which is the value of preemption. So again, revisiting that myth that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And what we found uh, was that preemptive transformations, in other words, turning around the successful company, turns out to be uh, the most important lever across many of the types of change that we, uh, we looked at, both in terms of its success rate, uh, the outperformance of the industry, and also the return on investment, uh, the investment being the investment in the, in the restructuring costs of the, uh, of the turnaround. Now, the trick here is, of course, is that it's very hard to turn around a successful company because there is apparently uh, no visible need, no burning platform, no given sense of urgency. Um, so the analysis I'm showing you today is not just um, uh, a numerical analysis. We, uh, we look deeply at case studies and we spoke to leaders. And in fact, creating a sense of urgency before the existence of the visible burning platform is a key uh, is a key leadership challenge. Um, so let me uh, go to the next slide. Um, the poster child for this um, is uh, Netflix, the streaming service. Although there are, um, I was going to say there are many examples. There actually are not many examples. It's surprisingly rare for successful companies to undertake major major preemptive change. But Netflix is um, is, is 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 one of them. Um, so if, if you remember, Netflix was the company which uh, displaced uh, Blockbuster and uh, took the, uh, the world into the uh, uh, streaming, um, uh, video streaming, as opposed to uh, DVD uh, or, uh, or, 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 or tape uh, rentals. And um, their business model was at one point DVD by mail, um, which was already disruptive. Um, and even though they were very invested in that model, and even though it was successful, uh, they had to disrupt that uh, with what they knew to be coming next, which was streaming. And it's very hard to look at a successful and growing set of numbers and say, uh, we're going to walk away from today's success in order to create tomorrow's success, but this is the, the nature of the preemption problem. This is why preemptive transformation is extremely valuable, but also hard and, and rare. Uh, next slide. Um, so part of the trick here is forward-looking metrics. One of the reasons why preemption is difficult is that more than 90% of the metrics which corporations use as senior levels to measure themselves are actually uh, backward-looking. Um, so profit measures how successful you were yesterday. Sales measures how successful you, uh, you were yesterday. Return on investment measures how successful you were yesterday. And of course there are good reasons for this. One good reason is the past has a higher degree of ob objectivity than the future. Um, and um, uh, the, 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 the second um, uh, uh, re reason is um, uh, we're, we're comfortable with, with what we know and we have an entire accounting profession and standards based upon measuring the past. Um, now this wasn't entirely a, a foolish idea in the past because uh, a, a few minutes ago I told you that the uh, the decay rate of competition, uh, in other words, the speed with which leaders become uh, laggards or leaders um, regress to the average has increased massively. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it made, made perfect sense to assume that the future on average would look like the past. Now we can show that that doesn't really make sense at all. So one of the things we've done recently, and we, we talk about it in the, uh, in the book, is um, a forward-looking metric called vitality. So you see the two circles on the chart. Performance is essentially the scorekeeping for what happened. Vitality is the more speculative, but nevertheless uh, extremely important perspective on 
what will happen. It measures the vitality or the growth potential of a business. So we, de we developed a metric um, which uh, uh, is uh, fueled by financial and mostly non-financial data, um, large data sets analyzed by machine learning to say, what are the best predictors that we have for growth? And it turns out that not perfectly, of course, because um, nothing is guaranteed about a firm's future, um, but to, uh, to, to a, 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 f a fairly pragmatic degree, we can measure the, the growth potential of firms and, um, uh, and, and we publish a league table each year with uh, Fortune called the Fortune Future 50 of the 50 uh, highest potential growth firms uh, in, the, in the world. And the merit of this is um, if I can only measure performance, I might be sitting there saying my profitability is top of the industry, um, uh, it's been consistently high, I'm fine. But if you also have a vitality metric, you can see, well, um, my performance is fine, but my prospective performance is not fine. And my performance is only fine because I'm mil milking an obsolescent business model. And, and that, f that fact alone it gives you the motivation and the, and, the, uh, and the objective basis to say, well, I need to preemptively transform. So let's look at the next slide, please. Um, now, uh, any change problem actually is a double change problem in that um, I've mostly talked about um, the, the world of business so far. In other words, we need to change things in the business. Um, but of course, we can't change things in the world unless we first change things in our mind. And one of the obstacles to change is the mental model. Um, so I may think that I'm in a certain industry. I may think that I'm in the publishing industry. I may think that the publishing industry is a very discreet and unique industry. Um, and I may think that I'm a, an academic publisher, so I'm a particular type of publisher. And I may believe that um, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm 20 years in the business, so I know, I know how, to, how to be successful in this business. Well, the first thing to say is that these are not facts, of course. These things change. Um, so the publishing world right now is, like many industries, has fuzzy borders. Um, is Amazon a publisher? Well, they're a sort of retailer. They're a digital platform. Um, they're also a publisher. Um, so we don't really know what, what an industry means anymore. So we don't really know what market share means anymore. And, um, and disruptive companies, challengers, do things in different ways. So um, one of the curious things I've noticed in strategy is that very well-equipped teams um, and uh, with excellent resources and great questions tend to go into a strategy process and intriguingly seem to come out of that process often with more or less what they went in with. They come out with a, a slightly strengthened version of the original business model, the original plan. And um, through painful experience, I, I think I've learned that you can't stretch your strategy unless you first stretch your mind because if you see possibilities through the lens of your current m mental model of the business essentially you will not see innovative opportunities uh, another way of putting it is um, uh, a business with a long successful track record will look at a, a disruptive idea and may say that it's ridiculous but really there are two flavors of ridiculous one of them is actually ridiculous and the other one is merely uncomfortable to you uncomfortable and unfamiliar to you. So I have a series of um, games that we talk about in the book um, where we, uh, I, I call them games because what is, what is play? Play biologically is de-risk learning. Um, so children play with plastic swords and pretend to fight with each other. Um, uh, it's, it's a great way of learning about self-defense and, uh, and, and, and combat without actually uh, uh, killing yourself and it um, uh, and it moves, uh, and, and you're able to execute it very quickly. Well, in the same way, companies can use their minds to play by considering different mental models. So I won't go through each of these games, but for example, one of the games designed to break current mental models before contemplating a transformation is uh, 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 inverting the company. Um, inverting the company consists of uh, thinking of everything you stand for, everything you do, everything you believe, uh, and then inverting that and saying, well, let's make, let's write down everything we don't do, everything we don't believe, everything we would never do, and then quite seriously make the best case for that inverse of your company. Um, and what we typically find is that um, uh, 
this is a, an enjoyable exercise. Um, um, actually, people are dimly aware of what they, they're not doing, but they could be doing. Uh, they're aware of the taboos of the company. They're aware of the past failures. And it's a very productive discussion for opening up the aperture. Um, another game, for example, is um, number 10, the, uh, uh, the preemptive postmortem. Um, and um, uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the high performing software company, for instance, uh, Altassian, has preemptive postmortems. And the idea here is you look into the future and you say, everything we were trying to do failed. Uh, we're at the press conference and we're explaining what failed. And you write essentially your, your, your obituary, you write your post mortem, <clears throat> and you get very realistic. You look at the, the realistic behaviors of the company and you ask, how plausibly could we not achieve what we're trying to achieve? And those are the very things, of course, that you'll need to build into your transformation process. So I, I personally found this was a very uh, interesting. Uh, perspective to, to, to develop and these games are actually battle tested with uh, with many companies now so um, I, I, I commend you to to take a look at uh, take a look at that chapter the next slide please and then lastly um, uh, you know we, we we look into the past I said partly because we we look through it through the lens of our mental model partly because we have backward-looking metrics, but also partly because you can't really measure behavior, or at least we think you can't measure behavior. Um, so how do, how do people report out on the success of their transformation? They give a PowerPoint presentation once a month, um, making their assessment on what's going well. They might show the project management chart. Well, there is a new game in town called organizational analytics, or some people call it workplace analytics, um, where actually you can measure real time and continuously things associated with change. Um, so for example, uh, Microsoft recently published in the Harvard Business Reviews a piece looking at online behaviors. So you can figure out who's working, how many meetings they're having, how long are their meetings, and you can look at, uh, for instance, who's leaving the firm, um, <clears throat> who's demotivated, who's high performing as a function of their actual real time uh, working environment. Uh, a slightly different example, there's a company called uh, Humanize, a, a spin out from, uh, uh, from MIT uh, that has um, uh, badges that people walk around with. And these badges can actually detect location, they can detect interaction, they can detect voice tone. And you can, um, and they also combine this with data on who's communicating with whom. So you can actually look real time at the evolution of the communication network. So the, the chart on the right essentially shows um, uh, you know, who is communicating with whom. And you may be able to see little islands. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a line, for example, uh, towards the top left-hand part of the chart. So it looks like there are um, a couple of parts of the organization that don't communicate with the rest of the organization. And you may look at that and you may say, well, that's new, that's important. They are supposed to be driving the transformation. And you see things in real time. You don't see things after they happened. And you also see them with a certain degree of uh, objectivity. <clears throat> so to wrap up, um, last slide please. Um, so to wrap up, um, we have this book on I think this very important question of uh, uh, the science of change and it's intended for any manager, any leader or any student of business that wants to uh, adopt a more scientific uh, approach to change. I, I, I don't pretend that this is the ultimate answer. I think this is a very fast developing field but this is you know, our perception of the state of the art, you know, as it, uh, as it stands today um, in, you know, actual companies that are beating the odds of change. So I'd be very happy to, uh, to take your, uh, your questions if you want to type them into the, um, uh, into the, into the chat. Thanks, uh, Martin, for the presentation. Um, now the audience has the opportunity to write uh, the questions in the chat room. I think there's, um, there are two so far, uh, is you correct, hopefully. Um, it's, could you comment the relationship between vitality metrics and investor decisions on the stock exchange? Break yes. it short period. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we looked at, um, you know, we've looked at um, both market and fundamental factors. Um, so we've looked at um, stock market growth 
uh, and vitality, market capitalization growth, and we've, we've looked at um, fundamental uh, revenue growth. Um, the reason we're focused on growth, by the way, is that um, in the short run, all sorts of things create value, uh, but in the long run, most, most value uh, comes from, uh, comes from uh, uh, growth. And, um, and what we find is that the, um, the market's implicit belief about the growth prospect, prospects of the firm, um, so one of the 16 factors I showed you on the chart was, the, was called the PVGO, the present value of growth options. And this is the market's implied growth potential of the company. So it turns out that this is um, an important variable, um, but it's not massively predictive and, it's, and it, can be, it can be significantly improved if combined with the other 15, uh, the other 15 variables. Um, so are we saying that we, can, um, uh, that, that, that we can that we can beat the market? Um, in, a, in, a, in a modest sense, yes, in that um, uh, there are non-financial data sets which are uh, which give important signals which are still not those signals are not fully arbitraged away. Uh, and in particular, the, for instance, the health of the, um, uh, the, 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 the technology portfolio of the company turns out to be, it's not surprising that it's important, but it turns out to be even more important than, uh, than, we, uh, than, than we might have thought. So the answer to your question is that the market's implied view of growth is, um, is an important component of the index, but it's only one of, it's only one of 16 components. Okay. Thanks, uh, Martin. Um, one question is, could this uh, be applied for the social sector? Um, well, to be honest, we haven't looked at that yet, but I, I, I think I see no reason why, uh, why it can't be. So I think the general conclusions of a more scientific approach to change, use of real-time analytics, uh, breaking mental models, um, de-averaging change, um, uh, understanding, um, you know, which factors are, are important. Uh, it's a it, it, it could be a little harder on some dimensions because in business we have this, um, um, we, we have a quant an easily quantifiable outcome. We can measure whether costs went up or down and revenues went up and down or market mm -hmm. cap went up and down. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have such an easy metric of success. Uh, in the case of the uh, nonprofit or the public sector, but the the principles absolutely uh, could uh, could be applied, and we've done a little bit of work on this. So we we um, it's actually not in the book; it may be in a subsequent book. But we have, uh, for instance, we wrote uh, some pieces on the um, uh, the adaptive public sector agency. We looked at the the value of uh, um, adaptive change or continuous uh, uh, change um, in the uh, in the in the in the not for profit sector. Okay. Um, let's have another question here. Uh, with regard to the vitality metrics, how many companies actually use the five to 10 year view? And maybe it belongs to this. Should our transformation program have a fixed endpoint or should it be under constant review? Um, right. So I think that very, very few companies have. Um, Formal, uh, a formal system for forward-looking metrics. They they qualitatively uh, may consider. Um, they obviously consider the future when they do their their their, their plans. Um, sometimes it's a, a ten or a twenty-year horizon. Um, I even came across one company that had a, a hundred-year horizon. Uh, but it's 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 pretty rare, and it's rare that it's formalized and part of the management uh, accounting system. But there are some companies out there. Um, you can. Um, you can Google um, um, the company, the, the top uh, civil engineering company called um, Thornton Tomasetti, uh, based in New York. It's, it's a company that designs um, um, uh, complex uh, buildings and bridges and things. Essentially, a bunch of PhD engineers that design complex structures. Um, so they have formally adopted Vitality as and, and, and essentially uh, had a makeover of their management accounting system. There are other companies that have their own um, their own way of doing this. Um, the most uh, the, the simplest one is that is that some companies have a freshness metric. A freshness metric is something that measures not only the performance of the portfolio, but the proportion of that performance which is coming from 
things that are less than a certain number of years old. So they're essentially saying, yes, we're performing on average, but is it coming from new things? It's a measure of renewal of, 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 the, of, the, of the portfolio. Now, in terms of your question about um, episodic versus continuous change, the, mm -hmm. uh, one of the later chapters in the book is, um, is actually about um, what we call always on change, uh, about change as, uh, as, as a continuous process. Um, so I think that change as a continuous process is, is highly desirable. Um, it's more and more possible um, now that we have um, uh, workplace analytics and we have um, great data and even greater data after COVID because of the acceleration of uh, digital transformation. We have data on many things that we didn't previously have uh, uh, you know, data on. Um, uh, I think there will still be a need for episodic change because even continuous change will sometimes um, uh, not be ready for a major shift in the world. So COVID is a good example of that, right? We could have been changing continuously and excellently to the steady state change pre-COVID, uh, but then we have the unanticipated event of COVID with, the, with an unanticipated profile, profile. So we'll still have a need for um, for discontinuous change, but I think there's a greater role for continuous change too. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, there's another question. Yeah, it belongs to maybe the Greuter. Uh, Denise said, I work for academic high education, which is a dinosaur mm. in change and any working and exploring this changes in these areas. Okay. Uh, yes, well, I, I um, well, you should give your view of that, uh, Stefan, but uh, my view is that um, some sectors naturally have very long cycles. And um, so one of the reasons for that is if something is capital intensive, you obviously have to use your assets for, ma for many years um, in order to uh, depreciate them. Um, and um, others um, um, have very slow product cycles. For instance, the pharmaceutical industry, depending on how you look at it, has a 10 or a 20 year um, uh, product, product cycle. Um, and then another, a third reason why some, some sectors uh, have a, a slow cycle is that they have a very slow and indirect feedback loop. And I think education, if I may say so, is one of them. Namely, um, you know, education serves society. You create useful skills in the world and those useful skills change. You know, we may need to know about, you know, if, if, if the managers of tomorrow need to know mm. much more about artificial intelligence than they ever used to, that's a new need. How, long, how quickly do those needs feed back into academia and, and education and, and change? How quickly do we start teaching uh, Chinese and artificial intelligence and algorithmic thinking in, in high schools or primary schools or universities, you know, not fast enough. Um, but the good news is, I think that the shock of COVID, the adversity of COVID, massively accelerated also in the educational sector, the adoption of digital um, uh, remote teaching. And uh, while that may not be perfect uh, on, on all dimensions, it gives you a lot of data about engagement, what's working, what the participants um, feel, what is relevant, how you compare to others, uh, which is which makes this feedback loop a lot stronger and a lot more uh, a lot more immediate. So, looked at another way, if you're a disruptor in education, I, I think it is it is a goldmine of, of of opportunity because of the inertia of the traditional model. Okay. Thanks, Martin. There was a question about is the book online? Yes, of course. You can buy the, the Kindle version, uh, the e version, uh, the print version on Amazon.com, for example. Um, um, there's also a question what is the premise uh, for preemptive change in an institution? When can it be started? Um, so, we, in theory, you could change unnecessarily much or unnecessarily often or unnecessarily preemptively. Um, um, you know, you can imagine, a, in theory, a situation where you never get good at anything because you're constantly changing things and you generate massive inefficiency, uh, you immobilize the organization, in theory. Um, <clears throat> we measured, one of the things we measured um, <clears throat> is, in practice, does that occur? And it's extremely rare for large companies. Um, um, so we measured the uh, the value of preemption as a function of the start of the 
of, of, of the start of the, um, <coughs> uh, the, the transformation. And, um, and we did that in various ways. So one of the ways was we looked at the timing of a shock and we looked at the, um, <coughs> the, 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 uh, or, or, the, or the beginning of the de decline in industry performance, for example, and the timing with which companies announced a transformation program to their investors. And um, we did this for COVID even. And, um, and what we saw actually was that really the earlier is the better with no practical limit. Um, so very few companies actually um, announce in advance of adversity, either endogenous or exogenous ad 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 adversity, uh, a transformation program. And those that do, uh, the ones that do so one month before the adversity um, do better and two months even better and three months even better it's a it's a, it's a continuous um, it's a continuous relationship without without practical limits so I think we don't need to worry in large corporations about changing too much I think we need to worry plenty about not changing enough and 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 preemptively enough and the reason for the, why this is the case I think is that Digital transformation is, digital composition is just so fast. Um, uh, think about the demise of um, some traditional um, uh, industries, for instance, um, you know, book retailing at the hands of uh, uh, digital uh, disruptors. I mean, when it happens, it can happen really fast and it's, it, may, it may be too late um, uh, to, to engage uh, once, the, once the writing is on the wall, um, which makes it a more judgmental process because uh, a manager or a leader has to essentially say, well, this is plausible enough that I want to apply the precautionary principle and future-proof my model against this possibility, even if it, uh, even if it doesn't come about or it comes about later than I, uh, than I thought. And the ultimate here, actually, I have to give you a, in, in the book we discuss the example of Alibaba. Alibaba has a, is, is an extremely change-oriented company, which is why we studied them a lot. And so one of their principles is the default is change. So in other words, if there's no reason to change, you change. And the reason, the logic for that is that the, the long-term cost of inflexibility uh, and blindness to, to competition uh, vastly outweighs the, um, the short-term, any short-term inefficiency of changing uh, unnecessarily. So this, they have this bias towards the default is change. Uh, thanks, uh, Martin. I, I think I'm, we are almost uh, on the end of this webinar. Um, we have maybe one or two questions. I will copy the chat and maybe Martin and I will answer on this, on this uh, open questions. Um, sorry for the technical problems, Martin, and also the audience. Um, I think nevertheless, it was a wonderful webinar. Um, the audience, thanks for the interesting questions. And um, yeah, Martin, for the thanks also for the great insights. And um, uh, I would uh, say that this webinar is recorded. Um, at the same time, you will find, you will find the video uh, on our YouTube channel, the Gorda, uh, at the end of the week. And um, I wish you all a good evening or afternoon or morning, depends where you are. At the moment, goodbye, take care, and I wish you happy Easter. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, thanks. Take care. Bye, everyone.